service setting three, starting on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and have sincerely repented them. And I pray you of your mouthless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro for this morning is found printed in your bulletins from Psalm 28. And we proclaim our intro at responsibly. The Lord is their strength. And he is the saving refuge of his anointing. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. To you I will cry, O Lord my rock, do not be silent to me. Because if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you. When I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices and with my song I will praise him.
Graft into our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness. And of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated now as we hear from God's word. The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after Trinity is from the 20th chapter of Exodus. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual is from Psalm 90. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Even from everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. Our epistle readings from the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? That as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please 
rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel.
God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for the sixth Sunday after Trinity is our Gospel reading in Matthew chapter 5. Assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. To be honest, we shouldn't really need the Ten Commandments at all. We have the golden rule that is written on our hearts. We're all experts in ourselves. We know what we like and what we dislike. What we want done to us and what we don't. So it's not at all difficult for us to figure out what is right and what is wrong. If we did not want to be killed in our mother's wombs, then abortion is wrong. If we do not want our beloved loving someone else, if that fills us with jealousy and pain, then adultery is wrong. If we do not like people talking about us, telling our secrets, or saying unkind things about us, then gossip is wrong. You see, it's not hard at all. You don't need a list of thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that. Oh, well, then again, except for the fact that we are all such really good liars. So much so that we even fool ourselves. And our fallen hearts are so corrupt so confused and hardened by abuse that many times we don't really know what we actually want. Abducted by death, we fall prey to the Stockholm Syndrome. Think of those who cut themselves or starve themselves or hide in their homes and cut themselves off from their family and friends. Why do so many of us turn self-destructive? I mean, come on, isn't our fallen nature above all selfish and self-centered? Why be self-destructive? And that's true, but it's worse than all that. See, it's bad enough that we live with this sinful nature. But even that, that sinful nature is not fully in control just of itself. Beyond your sinful nature, there are forces of darkness in this world that prey upon the weak even further. We have the unholy angels who fell with Satan to deal with. And they confuse us. They trick us. They manipulate us. So much so that, for example, some poor girls think that if a man hurts them, he is actually showing them love. That he is being attentive to them. They live in the buzz of terror and excitement. Desperate to be loved. But they don't really understand what that even means. Others think that they are fat, even when their bones are sticking through their skin, and that the only way they can be attracted to be desirable is to starve themselves. Now, this same sort of confusion exists in all of us, one way or another in such a way so that we cannot apply the golden rule as we ought. On top of that, we are experts at justifying ourselves, making excuses, and using a double standard. We think it's wrong if someone listens to hearsay that tells them of our gossip. We think 
it is wrong if someone whose wife or daughter stimulates evil thoughts in us looks at our daughter that way. We think we've earned what we have, that we've worked for it, but that everyone else, ha, they were given what they had. They walked into it where they got lucky. At our worst, we, we even make theological excuses. We blame God. We blame God for making women so beautiful or for making chocolate so delicious. <laughs> Whatever your temptation happens to you. And then we pretend as though our forgiven sins should still hurt or have any consequences. You know, a serial killer can be forgiven by God, but that doesn't mean he should be let out of prison. An habitual liar can be forgiven and go back to God. But that doesn't mean it's smart for anyone to ever trust him again. We must repent. And part of that means we need to rejoice in the Ten Commandments. Because they show us God's will. His perfect, holy will. They show us how we were created to be. Who we are supposed to be. And if they feel like a burden, that's because you are a victim. When the law says, you shall not bear false witness, and all of the other things it says, it's not trying to take your fun away from you, okay? It's telling you to do the right thing. It's telling you to leave your boy abusive boyfriend. To stop poking pencils into your skin. To stop fearing what you look like. The law is good because it is the will of the good and holy Lord. But we are fallen creatures. And if the law forbids that which we love, even if our love is confused, destructive. The law shows that we are evil, broken, not merely victims, but also criminals in and of ourselves. We need to recognize the co of codependence. Our pride and arrogance and selfishness sends ripples of pain across the world. We are victims, to be sure, but it is also our fault. We have loved sin as twisted and perverted as that sounds. We have loved sin. We must repent. And the only way out is by rescue. The Lord begins his great issue of the law with a promise and an historical reality. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then what the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law do is they establish a sort of a constitutional monarchy. See, our God is not a tyrant. He could be. I mean, it's not wrong to speak of him as sovereign over us, but he is not a tyrant. He is the Lord and he is our God. He doesn't have to, but he chooses to tie himself to his own law so that he is not above it. In the first place, he will be our God. 
He agrees to it. He insists upon it. You will not be left without a God who looks after you. You will not be left without a God who protects you and cares for you. He will not quit or stop no matter what. Even if we commit treason, even if we run after other gods, other husbands, even if we rebel and kill his son, he will not stop being our God. The first statement of the Lord is that he is the Lord our God. He brought us out of slavery. That he rescued us from death and Pharaoh. He will not stop doing that. This is who he is and who he will always be. Thus we know that there is a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. For only Christ keeps the law perfectly. He does everything that it demands. He does nothing that it forbids. He endures temptation in every way that we do. But he does not fail. He does not sin. He does not grow angry with his brother without cause. He does not look upon a woman with lust. He does not long for that which is not given him. Even, even something as simple as bread in the desert when he was hungry and no one else was there to watch him. He accepts what God the Father gives and waits. Never doubting that his Father is good and will provide. He endures in that faith and that hope to the very end. Even when he is forsaken on the cross by the Father and made a curse and actually becomes sin for us. That is not merely outward righteousness that's worthy of honor and respect. That is perfect faith. The correct and good relationship of the creation to the creator. And since the fall, not even the animals, the rocks, and plants can do it. So the Lord God creator joined his creation. Became a man in order to fulfill the law and satisfy all the demands of justice. He did not destroy the law. Nor the prophets. He kept the law in obedience. And then he kept the law in suffering and sorrow. For he allowed the law to do to him everything that it should have done to us. He took on its full force. In fact, he endured an eternity of hell concentrated down to three hours one Friday afternoon on a cross just outside of Jerusalem for all of humanity. And then, and then it was finished. The law was fulfilled. There was no more. And that righteousness he gives away for free to those who believe, who trust in Him. He pours it out in the waters of holy baptism, in His Word and preaching, in the holy absolution, in the holy supper. The Lord speaks His children righteous. That means He says it, and it is. Once He said, let there be light, and there was. So when he declares you righteous, you become righteous. 
now. Now he says, you are forgiven. You are mine. You are free. You are righteous. And you are because he says you are. <laughs> Every mom here knows that knows that, that reasoning, that line of logic. Why? Because I said so. If it's good enough for mom, it's got to be good enough for God, right? You're righteous because I said so. You're forgiven because I said so. You're free from the devil because I said so. And you are. And hearing this, you believe. You're thankful and you're full of praise. Jesus is the one who has indeed paid the last penny. So there is nothing left to pay or to do. And remember, according to the law, you couldn't do it the right way anyway. In this way, you have died to sin. And you now live to Jesus Christ. Until such time as you finally die to the flesh to await the resurrection on the last day. Tragedy, unfortunately, sometimes the only way a woman, even after a divorce, is free from an abusive husband is when that husband finally dies. We have been divorced from sin and embraced by Christ, remarried to a man who actually loves and serves us. Soon death, sin, and hell will die, and we will rise, free from our bondage, free to bask in the grace of Jesus Christ, who loves us to the very end. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with singing together our offertory, beginning on page 192, Created Me. Please rise.
In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Lord, in your mercy, Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Donald, our president, Michael, our governor, Christina, our mayor, and all who legislate, administrate, and judge our laws. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools, so that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue, and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Bless all those who defend us and keep them safe. Especially do we pray for our local and law enforcement and John, Colleen, Shay, Nicole, and Jessica in our sheriff's office. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept, we implore you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. We offer thanksgiving for the blessings you give to us, rejoicing in all your gifts of life, especially Susan, Aiden, Colin, and all those celebrating birthdays, as well as all those celebrating anniversaries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your Holy Spirit to comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially do we pray for Jim, Patricia, Mary, and their ongoing needs, Mark, Barbara, Tony, and Mara and their afflictions. All your people on earth struggling with the pandemic and all in our land concerned with both safety and justice and all those we remember now in our hearts. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow, and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now on page 194 with the service of the sacrament. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with Thanks unto the Lord our God. Amen. 
times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation, humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thankfully, we can print it in again, so we can be able to sing it. So the law commands and makes us know. 